And I'll go ahead and share my screen. So welcome everyone to the good morning and welcome to the 2021 Columbia Gorge Annual Economic Symposium. I am Jessica Mehta, I'm Executive Director for Mid-Columbia Economic Development District or MCHED as we say our acronym. And I'm pleased to host today's event with you. We sincerely appreciate the generous uh, contributions from our sponsors, the Dallas Area Chamber of Commerce, Northwest Natural and the US Economic Development Administration that helped make today possible. So our first presentation will inspire you with ideas to take away related to business, attainable housing and workforce development, followed by a presentation to provide you with a deeper understanding of our regional economy highlight changes over the past year and note what might be in the future. I am also, I'm gonna pause here just to note that unfortunately Jason uh, from Summit County, Colorado is ill and not able to join us. And I, I was really looking forward to sharing his presentation with you. Um, I have his slides, but I can't believe that I would be very helpful. So, um, but he has offered to reschedule just that portion, which I think a number of you would be interested in hearing. Um, what Summit County is doing. Colorado in general is five or 10 years ahead of us in the housing crisis. And so they've, um, they've implemented some uh, interesting ideas for this region that I was hoping to share. So we'll have to do that another time and we'll let you guys know about that. Um, but the next piece of the agenda is I'm excited. We're going to be presenting a draft of the 2022-27 Columbia Gorge Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, which this region has been developing over the last eight months. This is uh, McHead's sixth year hosting the Economic Symposium, and we regret the event is again virtual. Uh, over continued concerns from COVID-19. If you had asked me last year if we would be virtual again, I would have said no, but um, unfortunately we are. And we do miss the networking, which is one of the most important parts of today. For those of you that are less familiar with McHead, we were formed in 1969 by our five counties, Hood River, Wasco, Sherman counties in Oregon, Skamania, and Klickitat counties in Washington. And in recognizing that their economic fates were closely linked, the counties came together to form McHead to promote the creation of family wage jobs, the diversification of the economic base and the growth, development and retention of business and industry within the region. Our work falls into three categories. Uh, business assistance is provided through business loans, trainings and industry cluster development. Regional coordination focuses on challenges or opportunities that impact all of our communities such as renewable energy development, uh, broadband access and transportation. And technical assistance is provided through grant administration for complex federally funded projects or economic development services and project management support for efforts that will support our diverse economy and strong local communities. I am appreciative of our public private board of directors, which uh, as you see, there's 21 of them, um, but they represent our counties, our cities, ports, chambers, higher education and major private industries. And they set the direction for McKed. Since I can make them stand to acknowledge them today, I um, am sharing their names here on the slide and thank you to all of them. So uh, just a few logistics to note. Um, we will have plenty of time today for questions after the different presentations, and we will be posting the slides from today's presentations on the symposium webpage either today or Monday, um, and that is mckedorg forward slash symposium. So uh, with that, let me introduce our first session. The idea for this session versus a keynote speaker came after learning about uh, different ways of addressing some of the challenges facing our region from worker shortages to available and attainable housing. And we wanted to use this opportunity to share a little bit about what those different topics of interest are for many in the region. So this will be a series of presentations with time for questions. Um, we actually will have time for questions after each presentation. So we'll go ahead and do that. And our first speaker is Kip Baratov. CEO and co-founder of Fish People Seafood. 
Since 2012, Kip and his team have been disrupting the seafood industry status quo by introducing innovative and sustainable seafood products. Kip lives in the gorge, and they, just this year, they opened a storefront in the river. So, Kip? Make sure I'm on mute. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Let's see if I can share my screen properly. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, everybody see my screen? Yep, looks great. Excellent. Let me see if I can. <clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> my name is Kip Baritoff. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Fish People. Uh, Fish People's a seafood company here in the Pacific Northwest. We own two landings uh, in Oregon and Washington at the coast, one in Tillamook County one in Pacific County uh, at the mouth of the Columbia River, right in Long Beach Peninsula. And we have three brick and mortar retail locations, uh, one in Hood River, one in Garibaldi, one in Owaco. <clears throat> and then our business is primarily split between, uh, it's about 50% wholesale. And it was until the pandemic about 50% um, what I would call CPG goods, like consumer packaged goods. Uh, sold in grocery stores across the United States. We were in Walmart, Kroger, Whole Foods, Sprouts, all those kinds of good things from the East to the West Coast until we had to shut it down. And today is a little bit of a story about how we made the decision to shut that down during COVID and why. Um, <clears throat> as I introduced the concept for some of you of uh, what a B Corp is, which I think is actually fundamentally aligned with a lot of what McKed's uh, mission is that Jessica just went through. So our uh, simple vision for the seafood industry when we started the company was reward the many instead of the few. Um, and I want today, I'm going to try to explain to you uh, what that means, because I think that's, again, in the context of the values alignment that we have here on the phone, well, or in this virtual meeting that, uh, uh, that we have. And so I'm excited to see if I can dive in. But first, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, and this is, a, this is a deeply personal story uh, for me as it relates to our experience in COVID. I know that you all have your own COVID experience, which is unique and personal and probably equally gut-wrenching. I look forward to hearing those if anyone wants to share, because I find that sometimes commiserating uh, is a good thing. But what I'm delighted to share with you is that the values that we espoused during the COVID uh, time has been able to support rural counties here in Oregon and Washington in a way that I don't think it would have been possible if we, we weren't a B Corp, which is what I'm here to try and explain today. So let's see. Okay, a long time ago, capitalism. It's amazing, right? Isn't that awesome stuff? We're gonna make wealth for everybody. Super, super exciting. Um, I love capitalism. I'm a capitalist. I've started three companies. Um, and it's built on three fundamental principles at the end of the day. Short-term profits, maximizing shareholder profits, and the market fundamentally decides which products win and which products don't win, right? Uh, pretty simple, pretty easy. Uh, we forgot, I think uh, I skipped over though, uh, simple system of production and labor. Sorry, so in addition to those fundamental three oh, principles, no. you need capital, we need production, which includes factories plus people, and then that's what creates profits. So that's how our system effectively works in a super reduced <laughs> uh, uh, minimalist viewpoint, right? Uh, in that though, what happened is that we forgot a few things along the way, right? We've got issues that we're dealing with everywhere in, in our country, but in our region as well. We've got pollution. We've got things like workers' rights that we care about, whether it's around family wages, like we just said, or retaining in businesses to stay in our area. So how do you manage those things? Capitalism isn't designed necessarily to do that right off the bat. This is something we've had to learn and figure out along the way um, as we manage our businesses, uh, support our communities, et cetera. Now, before you go off and think that I'm just some crazy liberal environmentalist, I can assure you that I am, but I'm also not. Uh, I'm also deeply believe that uh, business and um, needs to take into account these things so it actually business can work and we can continue to create jobs. So let me explain what that means. In the euphoria of 
are capitalist pursuits. When George and Sally and Harry, and they all want more cows, we end up with this thing called the tragedy of the commons. And this is really pertinent in fisheries management. I work in the world of fisheries and the fisheries are a true uh, form of commons in a way that I think is very unique because you can't exert private property very easily in the ocean. The same way we can demarcate 20 acres of land, you actually can't do that very well in the ocean. I can't, I can put a 200 mile boundary around the United States, but if I've got a hundred fishing boats and they all fish the same general area, you can deplete the resource really quickly. So fisheries management, both from a regulatory and an industry standpoint, is subject to the tragedy of the commons, uh, i.e. too much uh, resource depletion in one area, right? Too much enthusiasm for capitalism in one area, right? Now, no, this isn't about being a socialist, but this is about understanding that if I extract too much resource, well, then, I don't, uh, I don't have an industry anymore and I can't create jobs anymore. So I'm gonna tell you a story. Does anybody know what kind of fish those are? Those are cod, Pacific or Atlantic cod, similar to the Pacific cod. Those are enormous cod, just in case you know, right? We, we, don't, we don't have cod like that anymore. Those are absolutely enormous, right? So, in 1992, which is not that long ago, the Atlantic cod stocks collapsed. That bar chart or the line chart there helps you understand that, wow, we were humming along from the 1850s until about 1960. And then somewhere in the middle of that industrial revolution, right, we got really efficient at catching fish. And we caught so many fish that within approximately 30 years, there were no more fish. The industry, the towns, these working waterfronts and rural communities collapsed because it was the primary form of economy for them. Uh, and the sad thing is, is that in 2000, the same thing happened here in Oregon and Washington in our ground fish fishery. It was declared a federal disaster and we had to stop fishing. Now, luckily there were other stocks that we fish like crab and whatnot, <clears throat> herring and or excuse me, not herring, but uh, Pacific whiting and shrimp and all those other things. But this really changed the view of fisheries management around the United States and in the world. And then the follow-up in 2000 is, oh my God, we're not fishing at a sustainable level. And sustainable levels is not just about the environment, it's also about communities and people that rely on those jobs, you know? So the industry sort of said, now what? And I had asked yourselves, like, what would you do in this situation? How do you reconcile the need for healthy economy with what the environment can naturally produce, right? That's what we were facing as an industry. It was our reconciliation with all that capitalism stuff that I started this presentation with. <clears throat> what fishing has done and what I think you're seeing in, in this B Corp movement that I'm gonna to explain to you is, is that the paradigm began to shift. Instead of just shareholder profit, those individual, the Harry, the Sally, you know, all these folks that right here wanna put their own cows or their own fishing boats on the water and just fish as much as they possibly can, right? Well, that helps individual shareholders for sure of the boats, but it doesn't actually help the broader set of stakeholders. For example, the community would suffer if we just let every individual fishing vessel go out there and do whatever it is that they wanted and catch as much fish as they wanted whenever and however they wanted. It wouldn't work out very well. So uh, how have we tried to address that? Inside our company, inside of fish people, right? We're a B Corp. And so the concept inside of B Corp is that what we would like to be able to do is make sure that as a for-profit business entity, that we are not just here to make sure that our shareholders actually make money. We are here to make sure that our stakeholders, the broader set of stakeholders that we serve as a company do well, whether that is the people in our supply chain in terms of the wages, uh, that we provide. We provide family living wages. We provide health care. We do all those sorts of things. We want to make sure that the environment itself is also taken care of, i.e. that there are enough fish stocks out there 
for us to keep catching fish because if we don't, then we don't actually have working rural communities at the coast. There are multiple communities at the coast or counties that have more than 25% of the county household income is derived from fishing. So if you don't have fishing, you have a pretty large hole in those economies. So we became a B Corp. We were the first seafood company in the United States to do this, to try to think through how we might be able to approach fishing a little differently um, than others. <clears throat> you make that declaration, you change your corporate articles, you're in good company, right? Everybody noticed Tillamook down here. Tillamook is actually a company that uh, is here in Oregon, as you well know. Uh, they're a particularly well-known brand across the United States. Uh, and there's probably a bunch of other companies on this page that you recognize. These are all for-profit companies, just to be clear, but who also believe deeply, much like I believe the Maquette community believes and the Maquette board believes, which is our job is to help service the broader stakeholders of a community versus just make ourselves rich in the process. And it's a nuance to capitalism at the end of the day. And it's really a values decision-making uh, process around how you manage uh, profit with inside your company. We get audited twice a, uh, every two years on our governance, on how we treat our workers, on how we uh, impact the community, on how we're impacting the environment and our service to our customers. If we don't get a score over 80, we are no longer allowed to be a B Corp. I liken this effectively to, um, you know, uh, uh, like accounting, auditing, right? Finances, you know, you get audited or finance, uh, you know, once a year. This is the same thing, it just happens every other year. Why are these things important to us? Um, these things are important to us because of this slide. This is a slide that I, decided to share with y'all that came out of a board meeting in April of 2020, uh, which is right at the beginning of the pandemic. In January, uh, fish people lost over three quarter of a million dollars. Uh, we had a hit to our PNL when China shut down. Uh, so we started experiencing COVID in January before it came to the US. Uh, <clears throat> the havoc that was wreaked on our wholesale business, which was half of the business, was astronomical, as you might imagine. Uh, seafood, you might not know, 70% of seafood is full, sold into food service in the United States. 30% uh, goes into the grocery store. And it is very different than pretty much every other food category in the, United, in the US. About 70% of most food goes into grocery and 30% goes into food service. Seafood's ultimately different. And you can think about that. How many people cook seafood at home versus how many people cook or eat seafood when they go to the restaurant? That's your primary difference there. So when we were figuring out what to do, our wholesale business was cratering. It was bleeding so red that we weren't certain what we were gonna do in our retail business. Uh, our grocery business was actually going through the roof because everybody was pantry loading. And what I talked to the board about was how long would our grocery business actually last? And can we continue to support the communities that are actually catching the fish, offloading the fish, cutting and processing the fish uh, with our retail business? And if you read this slide, you'll note that Pacific County is similar in many respects to the, some of the counties that are in the McKed region, right? We're talking about rural you know, non-farm jobs at the time of the pandemic were still below 2008 recession levels, right? That's not so great. Uh, you have opportunities clustered in ag and manufacturing or service supporting tourism, right? We have naturally resource extractive dominant industries that are in the process of transition and these coastal economies don't they even have less of a transition than I think we do some of our counties do out here. Right? We have lots of affluent visitors that come from other places, you know, um, and for us, unique in Pacific County, the largest competitor we had in the port of Owaco had gone bankrupt just a couple months before COVID. And so we were now effectively the largest employer in the county, and we were servicing over 400 families in the middle of COVID with a business that was upside down because our entire markets had gone away. This is a story I'm sure many could tell about their COVID experience. What I don't know is how did we manage through it? Did everybody do it the same way that we did? We made a decision during this process 
or during this time to shut down our retail business, which might sound crazy, right? It was the one thing that was working. People were pantry loading, but we made a decision that pantry loading and that short-term spike was not going to last long-term and that we had a duty to actually support those 400 families over and above the ability to continue to build a national brand, which at some point for our investment group is how you would make all their money, right? If we build a brand, we would sell it for probably three times revenue is generally the going rate when you build a large enough brand. You can make a lot of money doing that. And we could have continued to lean into that pandemic and cut off the wholesale business that wasn't working, right? We decided to not do that. What we decided to do is actually, uh, uh, between my board and myself, we made a decision that we were going to support these rural counties, keep and maintain these jobs, uh, and because it was a far greater import to us to have at least get through 2020 and be a break-even business on the wholesale side of things and support those 400 families than it was to worry about the few set of shareholders that would have made a ton of money if we had doubled down on the boom in the retail business that we were experiencing. And while I'm delighted to say that we made that choice, I think it was a good investment in our communities and rurally, but we wouldn't have been able to do that, I don't think, if we hadn't made a B Corp, to be perfectly frank. The values around understanding the broader set of stakeholders um, that we were serving within our supply chain and our business of owning the docks and working directly with the fleet all the way through to the consumer is what enabled us to do that. Because in our industry, when you go back to rewarding the many instead of the few, what I would tell you is that our industry doesn't think always very well about rewarding the many. Uh, it focuses primarily on a few core set of shareholders. It's a heavily consolidated industry that looks after itself um, and it's growing and changing but it doesn't always take care of folks um, the way that it might in terms of providing good living wage jobs, healthcare, um, taking care of uh, everybody along the way. Uh, and so that's what we did. And it is an investment in American fishing fleet. So what you might not know, a few facts I skipped over because I could talk about fishing all day long, is that 90% of the seafood you eat in America has been imported. I want you just to absorb that fact for a minute. 90% of what you eat has been imported. And 90% of what we catch is actually exported. It's unbelievable bad math in my view, right? Um, it's like shipping logs to China, they make furniture and then we buy the value added product. You know, I'm not quite sure why we do that. You know, um, so in supporting and trying to get folks to eat American fish and support our American fleet, um, this was the investment and decision that we made. And I'm proud that we made it. Um, our business is now half the size that it was before COVID, but it's still supporting those 400 families at the coast in those rural counties. And we managed to survive, um, even though it didn't look like for a while that we might be able to. Uh, but I am glad that our values as a B Corp help us make those decisions along the way, as opposed to uh, not. Um, and I think that's part of what I wanted to share today, because when you look at economic models or supporting communities and building industry and business, I'm a deep, deep believer in the American food producer, whether they be on land or at sea. Um, and I'm a deep believer in local regional economies supporting and eating that food that gets produced. Um, and I would love to see more of that happen as opposed to us export as much as we do and import as much as we do. In particular, because in seafood, when we're importing stuff, we often don't know where it comes from. And a very significant portion of the global seafood supply chain is fraught with environmental destruction. So if you go back to that slide, Oh, close to 80% of the stocks globally are at capacity or over capacity. So they're nearing collapse or could end up collapsing if we continue to put pressure on them. 
And there's a fine balance line between catching the right amount of fish versus having no fish at all and then having a variety of economies go out. So when you buy fish, it's important to buy American because it, you're actually supporting healthy fisheries, well-managed fisheries, and American fleet is what I would tell you. Um, and so we're happy to be able to do that here. And the B Corp is what I think drives the value system inside the company to make sure that it's thinking broader about the communities that we operate in versus just the actual shareholder profit that might come from a few investors. That would be what I have. Questions? This is yeah, we do have time, time for a few questions if folks want to either unmute yourself or put something in the chat. Oh, this is good, kind of Clement. So, um, so you ended up focusing on the uh, the the retail market rather than the wholesale market. Is that correct? No, uh, we we built. I should distinguish there. We built a couple brick and mortar retail locations during the pandemic, the one in Hood River. Uh, and we built the second one at the coast. We already had one at the coast. What we shut down was our grocery store business where we had consumer packaged goods. We had packages of jerky. We had pre-made soups. We had frozen meal kits that we were selling nationally at the time. And we pulled that business off the shelf. And we doubled down on our wholesale business and used the proceeds from shutting down that one business unit in the grocery store to support and maintain the rest of the business um, as the way to move through. I.e., we made an investment in the supply chain as opposed to the <clears throat> brand side of our, our business. Thank you. Kip, if folks want to try to buy American caught fish at the store or in a restaurant, I feel like the store would be a little bit easier. How would they do that? Uh, you ask, right? So you can ask your fishmonger anywhere, ideally would know. Uh, not all of them do, but I would ask. Here at Rosars and Safeway, Freddy's in the Dalles, um, you know, I think some of those products in there are American fish. Um, you'll see whether it's Alaska or you can ask about if some of the stuff's from the Pacific Northwest. I think it's some of the more challenging stocks is shrimp. Shrimp is the number one seafood item in the United States and most of it, 90% of it's imported. So you'd have to ask very specifically for uh, good shrimp. But I think the biggest thing is ask questions. Where does it come from, right? Is it good for the planet? And are the people that are catching it, are they being taken care of uh, in a way that they deserve to be taken care of? That's how I would approach finding it. Or you can come down to fish people in Hood River <laughs> and buy fish and you'll know that you're supporting Oregon and Washington fishermen. I'll also add we have great um, tribal fisheries here where you can buy fish and folks like Brigham Fish and Cascade Lock. So we are lucky in some ways. You sure do. Yeah. Scott Bailey. Yeah. Uh, so it's real interesting uh, listening to your story. Um, and there's actually a few parallels, I think, with what's going on at Intel right now, uh, which you may have read about, that they yeah. are, they have made the decision to reinvest in manufacturing yeah. and not to outsource their knowledge and their skills, which has really hurt a lot of other uh, US-based companies. Um, and they're getting hammered for it uh, in the stock market. Yep. Even though it's absolutely the best long-term strategy for their success, uh, there's so much focus on the short run uh, profit for shareholders right now. Um, I hope their board sticks with their strategy, but in the, the version of capitalism that we have in the US right now, that's an open question going forward. I would agree with you, Scott. 
I think the capitalism is great. Don't get me wrong. I am a deep capitalist. I've started three companies and I think that it's a wonderful engine of economic development. I just think we've got to adjust it in a way where these are the challenges right here. This short-term profit stuff, if we can't think longer term like Intel is doing right now, we're gonna, we, we've got a ton of problems, right? Uh, maximizing only shareholder profit doesn't take into account communities, right? That sentence right there prevents you sometimes from paying, um, uh, at least in the bigger companies, better wages, right? And retaining employees. And I get it, a small company, I understand you know, the complexities of managing the owner operator business and you know, how much do you pay your employees versus how much do you take home? And it's a balancing act, you're trying to feed everybody but in the broader sense, for the largest segments of our economy, we've got to think more about stakeholders and more about long-term profit and what our communities are going to look like 30 years from now than we need to just next week. It's hard to do, though. It's a hard thing to do for all of us. And I, I appreciate that challenge. Well, thank you again, Kip. Um, I'm going to move us on to the next presentation. I know you have to take off, so appreciate it. I'm so sorry. Yes, my dog is missing, and I need to go find my dog um, because my family and my children are going to be apoplectic if I don't. So <laughs> I'm very sorry. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And good luck. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Kip. Right. So our next presenter, again, I for folks that... Uh, joined us a little bit later. Unfortunately, Jason from Summit County, Colorado is ill today and we are going to need to, um, he has offered to reschedule his portion of the agenda and we can send that out. Um, but I am very happy to have with us Kurt Berger. I heard him at a, a different uh, attainable housing uh, workshop and thought it was a great model to share with you. Um, so attainable housing, when we say that, we mean that it's housing for folks that earn up to 120% of the area median income. Um, and Kurt is the, um, let me find it, the student home builder director of Hermiston High School in Oregon. So Kurt, you wanna take it away? Good morning, everyone see and hear me? Yeah. Yep. All right, so I have a little different uh, story. We're not talking about fish, although I like that story. I'm a uh, longtime uh, teacher here at Hermiston High School, starting my 31st year. Uh, so about 10 years ago or so, uh, the administration at our school, uh, the local businesses, uh, mainly through the Northeast Home Build Association, wanted to see if we could figure out a way to give uh, students that are interested in the trade, specifically construction, you know, an opportunity to work on a, on a real project, on a real home in the school environment. And so that's how this thing came about. Uh, I was in the classroom uh, doing my thing. We had a meeting with CTE, so Career and Technical Education, formerly known as uh, Vocational Education. And they told us that we got a grant from the state, federal government, where, and it was kind of unique because they, they wanted to see if they could give us a grant. It was around $400,000. Can we start this construction program? And then can we build a house, sell the house, and then continue uh, to, to move that forward with just the one lump sum? And so we're now, we're working right now on our eighth home. And um, so I knock on wood, we've been successful so far in making and selling homes. We were very fortunate at Hermiston to have, the, the school district was very good with their money. We actually had land. I get, I'm gonna try to answer questions that I get all the time. So we had land. They had it surveyed out. Um, uh, we have a cul-de-sac, two cul-de-sacs with 11 homes in them. And so we're gonna build, a, a, the plan is one home a year. And that's what we've been able to do. So what we do is we have a construction one, two, and three. There's an intro class too. We try to identify students that are interested in the trades. And then basically what this is, is in their, usually it's their junior, senior year. These students uh, are gonna come out to the job site and this year we have 12, it depends on the year on how many we have. And the reason it was Columbia Basin student homes is because we had students from Umatilla, Stanfield and Hermiston High School. And we did that, I think originally they thought they could get the grant money if they included more schools, which is true. And then it's a great opportunity for the smaller schools. Now I'm a long time coach, so it was a little awkward. Uh, you know, now we're buddies with schools that I was in competition with for years. So that was kind of interesting. 
And then the last couple of years, the, the COVID did not stop our program as far as working because we were in a situation where the students drive to the job site. It's really just about a mile from the high school, but they were able to drive to the job site and we just work like uh, everyone else worked that was working. Uh, I don't know how to describe that normal you know, jobs in COVID, you worked, if you got sick, you stayed home, if you didn't, you went to work. So that was, we were very fortunate that way to have that happen, but we have 12 students. And, and the idea is that you take these 12 students and the, they're gonna, it's just a job. Like they're gonna come out, they grab their hard hats, safety glasses, tool belts, and we build a house. We literally build a house from the dirt starting in, in August uh, into at the end of June. And we have this high-end modern energy efficient, really it's a custom home. So to give you an idea, like the last couple houses sold for 400,000, uh, 450 last year. And I think this one's going to go for 500, uh, 2,200 square foot, kind of three bedroom, four bedroom type houses. But they're, you know, they're, they're super modern. They're super custom. We work with Energy Trust of Oregon. And so they're, you know, it's a real high end home. We actually did that on purpose. Or I think that we did that on purpose. Uh, we build one, we're on the high end in this kind of, you know, uh, really it's a, if you drove down our street, it's like the street of dreams kind of thing, these homes. And so we're out of the market of all the other builders. And then the idea of course is that we get these students, they get a, it's like a land lab, they get to work on this house for an entire year. And then at the end of the year, if they're interested in the trades, they can continue and, and uh, you know, go work for someone we're hoping locally or they can go to college. And we've had a bunch of students that have done that. You know, it's kind of interesting when as a builder, you know, I had students that came in here that were working on the foundation. It's an ex-student that's working with the local contractor, and that's what he does. So here's my student came back. Last year, one of our ex-students put in the kitchen for us. And I actually have one of the students working with me right now. So it's myself, the student as a contractor, and then the students, and that, that's how we build the house. From a school standpoint, as soon as we found out about this, and, and I was the guy picked to, do, to work this program, uh, I went out and got my contractor's license. So um, I don't know if you know this, but to get a contractor's license is just taking a test, which usually teachers are pretty good at doing, but it doesn't mean you know how to build a house. And so the only way that we got this house built with me, and I was the CAD guy, so we, you know, I, I understood architectural drawings and those kind of things, but I hadn't really built a house before. But we were, we were closely with the our Home Build Association. So our builders and suppliers, they actually hooked me up with one of the builders. He was kind of my... Uh, you know, my mentor, and then, you know, anytime I had questions, uh, it allowed me to be in a group of people that I could call anytime and answer questions. We work with local contractors framing the house. Uh, first couple initially had more help from them than students, and now we pretty much, we do everything that we can legally get away with doing, uh, and, and what I mean by that is the students aren't plumbing, they're, we're not doing electrical work. We try not to do things that, that, uh, I've been warned about that students aren't that good at like painting, <laughs> even though we have done painting, the students typically get paint all over their body and everything. And maybe the paint, painting job's not that great. But we try to do all the framing, all the finish work, all the siding, all those kind of things. Like right now we have a house framed up waiting for trusses. They're gonna come on the 12th and then we'll be on the ground. And then we'll try to do everything we can to help folks up on the top plate and, and the guys that are rolling the trusses. And we've done that, you know, kind of from a safety thing. Now, our program, the students, it's a class uh, for them. So I have 12 students, six uh, one period and six the next period. They're actually two periods. So they're, they're out there about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes. And, it, and, and we're on school ground because some people ask me about that kind of a thing. It's just it, it's the, the safety side of the thing, like running nail guns, saws and everything. It's just like we do in a normal classroom. I did it for years and years. Now we're just actually on a job site. And what they do is they show up and then every day we just work on building a house. And uh, like I say, it's a, that we do uh, some high-end things. And the reason I bring that up is because we can save money obviously on labor and then we can put that money into things that normally wouldn't be in, in a house. Uh, and, 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 and then we're trying to hit this market that's a little higher than the rest of the communities who are not bothering folks from that standpoint. We do pay for everything that comes that comes up. Now, obviously I try to get bids, the lowest bids if I can. And then, and then the other thing that we provide in our program is all the suppliers and builders that are that we're you know, spending money with, we try to get them to donate a 5% back for a scholarship program. So we actually give out two, $3,000 scholarships each year for students that wanna continue in the trades. And they've been very good about that. And I mentioned the Home Bill Association because if you're gonna start one of these programs, that's a huge thing to have is, is uh, uh, people and and uh, 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 folks in the trades that you can 
rely on to give you information and help you do what you got what you need to do. And so that, that's been a, 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 a great benefit, especially for, for me. I have no problem calling anyone that I know in there and they would give me help and, and work with their students. But that's kind of our, our, our story. Um, and like I say, so far, you know, we've been successful doing this. Um, the last couple of years because of COVID, we haven't had students from Umatilla or a Stanfield. We're hoping to get that group back. And, um, you know, it's always a continual battle to try to find the students that are going to be most benefit from a program like that. The, and then the other thing that we do besides the actual students that build the house are through our ag program, our landscaping class, they do all the landscaping for the house. So they work with a local landscaper and they come out, you know, you know, the thing that's neat about our program is we actually have the land in the, in the, in the, uh, the actual lot that we're going to build on. So when I go to the, the architecture class or the CAD class and say, here's what I want on the next house. And like yesterday, I was just talking to three of the students and I go, I really, really would like to use one of your plans, but it has to be what, what we want. And, and students sometimes don't, and I said, if it doesn't fit that lot, we're not gonna use it. So we're going through this process, but they actually have a real project. The landscaping class is gonna landscape for a real house that we're gonna sell. Every year I bring them in and I say, look, look at all these houses. If you screw the front of this house up, we're not gonna sell that house. You're gonna ruin my program, don't do that. We bring in our architecture students, say here's the lot that we've got right here. Now, right now we're going around the cul-de-sac. So we're going around this arc and it's different than when you're not on an arc. And so we're trying to get these houses to fit on the land. And, and so we're going through that process. Then we have the other construction classes have an opportunity to come out and see, you know, when we put in the foundation, when we put in the floor, the walls, they can see the whole process and they come out lots of time. So there's not just the 12 students that are building the house. There's all the, you know, hundreds of other students. And we have uh, business students that are involved in some of the marketing and advertising. It sounds uh, uh, funny, but at the end of the year, when we have an open house and we always try to do that, of course, COVID makes that a little bit weird. But we have a big open house and we have we invite the community to come see this house. And of course, you can imagine the first house we built eight years ago, they thought it was going to be like a shed sideways or something crooked because high school kids touched it. And when they walked in, they're like, good grief. I mean, it was awesome. And I can tell you right now, if you want to see some uh, homes that are on the street of dreams, come down our street. They're all, they're all unique. They're all uh, very impressive. And you can tell immediately when you drive down the street. So anyway, they come in, they go, wow look at what these students have done. And so ever since then, you know, our, our reputation precedes us. And, and now they know that they're going to get this really high end, high finishes. You know, we have a, a sound system, fax system, uh, outdoor barbecues, um, all these things that uh, most people would like. And most of us do not live in a house as nice as a house that we're building. And that's also unique. But what this does is it gives us a chance to have a lot of students come in there. And what I was going to say about the open house is, it sounds weird, but my students that have built on the house for a year, they're sick of the house at the end of the year, right? If you've been working on this thing. So they're not the best people to advertise your house. So I usually have like food for them in the garage and we hand out t-shirts or something. And then we have business student, uh, students that are, you know, good at uh, um, advertising, the selling of your home. And we bring them in and they advertise and show the house off because they're a lot happier about seeing this new house than guys have been working at it in the, the mud, rain and yuck. But that's kind of our program, and, and so far we've been very successful. We did look at uh, uh, the other programs in the state of Oregon because there's some very successful programs that have done kind of the same thing. And then we're just in a very unique situation to have the single high school and the single community, and we happen to have the land, and we have a tremendous commitment from our administration, the school, to promote this. Uh, and I, you know, remind the students, you know, we're putting four hundred thousand dollars behind these students' education so they get a, a real opportunity to work on a real house and develop some real skills. And the students of mine that wanna go into the, the industry and the trades, they get hired immediately. And I get asked every day about you know, who's next. So that's kind of our story. Uh, if you got any questions, ask away. So Kurt, is your is the website Columbia Basin Student Homes .org? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll put that in the chat so folks can go look at pictures. ColumbiaBasinStudents.org, yeah, I, I might have to think about that. <laughs> I, I found it. I yeah, just wanna make sure that that was what it's called. Yeah, that's what um, it is the street on school property? Yeah, the, the property is the school's property. And every year we sell, they have to transition that property to the person that buys it. Yes. So it's that, that question's asked because from a liability standpoint, I'm the general contractor. All the subs can work underneath my license and I'm also a high school teacher. And then it's our land. So when they talk about, you know, using some of this equipment out there, we're on, it's just like a high school class if I was in the physical building except when we're out, you know, and playing in the dirt. 
Um, do you engage any students with learning disabilities in the program? Yeah, it's a normal high school class. Anyone, so typically we have an application process. And so the students that are interested apply and then, you know, they go through that process and if they're accepted, you know, they're in the program. But yeah, we, uh, we teach everyone. That's the <laughs> good thing about education. If there's other questions, feel free to unmute yourself or keep adding them to the chat box. There's a lot of really good feedback or people are very excited, Kurt. I hope you read that. Jeremiah? Yeah. Hey, Kurt, this is Jeremiah Blue from the Port of Cascade Locks. How are you? Good. Good. I'm not surprised that this program is so impressive and so successful. If anybody doesn't know, Kurt built an unbelievable wrestling team that dominated for, year, for years out of Hermiston High School. So uh, it doesn't surprise me that this kicked off with the same sort of energy that I saw that happen early in the 2000s or I guess 2000. I don't remember that run you went on, but it was impressive. Did you guys follow some sort of roadmap on this? Is there other national or schools nationally that are doing this? And you said, okay, this is how they're doing it. This is how we're going to do it. Or do you have other schools now at this point that are looking to you as sort of the, the standard of this is how this gets done? Yeah, there's, there's several different programs around the state. Forest Grove has the longest standing one. And so when they started this and I was going through my little contractor process, I went with administrators all around the state. We actually looked at their programs. We're, we're unique, like Forest Grove is always looking for land. We actually have enough land right now for 22 homes. So we're on the eighth one and we have, you know, uh, 14 left, whatever that adds up to. Uh, and so uh, we're very fortunate that way. So, you know, we've got 14 more years that we can build without even looking for land. And, but yeah, we looked at the other programs and we tried to copy as, you know, as many of the things that, have, that were relevant to us. And of course, like you said, now people are asking us, well, how did you do that? And, and, uh, and, and that's why we're here talking right now, because we can show what we did. But we had a lot of unique things in place. You've got to have an administration that wants to support this kind of a thing, because, um, you know, there's a lot of money involved. And then you got to have a guy like me that can go do the program. And, you, you know, you mentioned wrestling. That was 100 years ago. But the uh, I was very well known in the community, and I know how to get things done. I don't know. How, I didn't know how to build anything. So I joked, the guy that learned the most in the last eight years about construction is me. But I did know lots of people in town and I, I know how to get along with people. We try to use our suppliers through the Home Bill Association, but I also try to rotate them, right? So I don't use maybe the same electrical company every year. And that's interesting because as you know, in sports, when I have a formula for win, I never change until somebody beats me. But in this, we keep moving things around using different suppliers as much as we can because they're trying to promote the local business uh, folks in, 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 the, in our area. And so it's kind of unique that we have to do it. And that means, I have to get along with everyone and I'm kind of in the middle, right? They love me when I use their company and they may not love me quite so much the, the year I don't use them. Uh, but um, everyone has been very supportive in our community and that's why we've been able to sustain this and keep this thing going. Um, Kurt, what does the square footage of your homes tend to be? Uh, 2000, this one, this year's is a 2337. Uh, this is the first year we actually going to have an upstairs bonus room. So I got to learn how to put stairs in that kind of stuff. Uh, but they're, they're typically three, four bedroom or three bedroom with a family room, living room. But like we, we put in all these, you know, like, like we'll stone the fireplace, stone the front outdoor barbecue. Last year we had double freezer fridge, 72 inches of glory. And then when you went beside it, there was a walk-in pantry that was looked like your kitchen cabinet. So it was hidden. And uh, my photographer who took a bunch of pictures of the house didn't even take a picture of that because he didn't know it was there. And so that we, we do all these, you know, those kinds of things. And of course we have speakers throughout the house and, and a VAC system. The VAC, I always advertise about central VAC system. We have the hide hose, so it's actually in the wall of the house. So the hose pulls out of the wall, you vacuum and then it sucks back up into the wall. And the kids love putting that in. And of course we love doing the speakers and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Any more questions for Kurt? Kurt, you're still running cross country? <laughs> a couple knee surgeries. No, I'm not moving that much. Oh, this is Dallas Friendly. <laughs> How are you doing? My good. My my brother is. <laughs> One of you at least down, still. I've slowed yeah. down quite a bit. <laughs> but we all we all ran in, in cross country in high school together. So <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Didn't expect to see you today. <laughs> um, Kurt, do you have any plans for higher density housing? Like two well, purchases or more? Right now, uh, we all have our little, I'm just working on what we're working on, right? Uh, what they're going to do after these uh, 22, I have no idea. 
Um, and again, it kind of, it was the market that we shot for and, 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 it, and so far it's working pretty good. And like I see a question about there is, yes, we, we have to, we need to sell the house and then that money builds the next house and the school board and, and, and other folks are very happy every time we have that sale. <laughs> And last year we sold it really early. And this year we've had three or four people already looking, as you know, because the housing's in short supply. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think we're going to sell this quicker than we have in the past, the way the current market is. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kurt. And thanks for everything that you're doing in Harmiston. Thank you. Um, our, we'll go on to our next presenter. So um, thinking about what we're doing for the trades here in the gorge, um, their uh, Columbia Gorge Community College has been growing and changing to meet the demands of the Gorge and has a lot, they've done a lot um, with the Skills Center opening this year and have even more plans in the works. So I thought it'd be a great time to welcome Dr. Marta Yaron Cronin, uh, president of CGCC and Dan Spots, CGCC director of capital projects and community relations to share an update. Great, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay. Here we go, hopefully you can see that. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to fill you in on some of the great things happening at CGCC that are building and supporting our local workforce. And now my thing is not advancing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, for those of you who may not be aware, CGCC has two locations, one in the Dallas and one in Hood River. Our Dallas campus sits on Scenic Drive adjacent to Cirrhosis Park. Because of our geographic location, we have the opportunity to serve four counties, Hood River and Wasco on the Oregon side and Clickitat and Skamini on the Washington side. So this is an area of view, aerial view of our Dallas campus. Prior to 2020, we had four main buildings that were part of the college. So that's these right here, these two, this one, and then this one. And then over here to the right, some of you might be familiar with our Fort Dallas Readiness Center, which is just outside this shot. And that building was a joint venture with the National Guard. We used the first floor of that building and the second and third floor have shared spaces. So this morning, I really wanna tell you more about this highlighted space right here. So just a, a brief backstory for those of you who might not know, in 2015, the college secured funding from the state in the form of 11G bond money, $7.3 million to be exact. And it had to match that for the purpose of building an advanced skill center. We knew that we did not have adequate facilities to survive, to, to be able to support the thriving industries in the gorge. So we had to build additional space. So recognizing the need for affordable housing and how that was impacting our students, the college conducted a housing feasibility study and it confirmed what we already knew. Some of our students would not be able to attend or enroll in a program unless we help them solve their housing situation. We had students living in vans in our parking lot. And having housing on campus allows us to draw and train from areas that are outside our immediate reach. So we went back to the legislature and requested that we be allowed to use some of the funding for housing. So they agreed and we secured our match and began construction. So we appreciate the support of the city of the Dallas, Wasco County, and we also got a um, bridge loan from the Port of the Dallas to help us through this process. And the college secured the rest of the funding through a full faith and credit bond that is the college's responsibility. So this is a true example in my eyes of how a community coming together can really make things happen. CGCC is really fortunate to have such a supportive community. So in July of 2020, we broke ground and began construction right here in this highlighted space. So I think it's noteworthy to mention that despite the fact that we were operating under pandemic conditions and at one point were completely closed, these buildings were constructed and everything within them ready for the start of the fall term just a couple of months ago. That's about a 14 month span from the day we broke ground to the time we opened the building up to students. And for those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to visit, allow me to show you all the wonderful things that are going on to support workforce in the gorge and in our surrounding regions. So this is the entrance to the building. This is the floor plan, just a basic. Our two major bays are dedicated to construction technology and to advanced fabrication and uh, advanced manufacturing and metals fabrication. 
we did surveys, we looked at economic development data, and we realized that those were really the industries that needed more support from us. So the main parts of the building are dedicated to that. But the building is built to be flexible so that we can continue to adapt to meet the needs of the region as time goes on. So this is the, the, the sign to the building. And what's cool about this building is that this was made by the students, right, under the supervision of their, their instructors. But it represents the two main programs in the building. So you've got the construction technology, and then you've got the, the advanced manufacturing and metals in, in this part right here. So this is the students who did this with the supervision of their, 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 super, their uh, teachers. So this was very impressive, we thought. <laughs> so when you enter the building, you walk into the lobby area, and that, that happens to be Kim Morgan, one of our Wasco County board members. And you're faced right here, we have a donor wall. So we were going to have this big ribbon cutting on September 11th, but we did not feel it was um, safe enough to bring too many people close together. So we put off the celebration for now, but our director of our foundation, Wendy Patton, has been very busy securing uh, donations for people who are going to be on this donor wall. But what's really great about those donations is that the majority of them are being used to directly support students by way of scholarship and allowing them to purchase their course materials. Some of these programs are, you know, have expensive supplies. So the students are able to use scholarships to enroll in those programs and the cohorts are full right now. So we're getting a lot of good feedback on that. So this is just the only really traditional classroom in the building. And this is a space that using this partition in the middle here can be divided into two small spaces. But we have a lot of um, community uh, organizations that rent space or come need space for meetings. So we think that this will help serve the community as well in that capacity. So this is what it looks like set up in one way. But what's also great about this is that anywhere on our campus, you've got those great views of the gorge. So if you wanna have a meeting where you've got some great views of the gorge and great facilities, then you can come on up to the skill center and we're happy to, to share our space. So moving on, we have our major bays in, in the center are dedicated to those two major programs. So the first program we're talking about here is construction technology. So this is our fabulous instructor here, Glenn Wood. Glenn is a former contractor and he has a lot of great experience and expertise to share with our students. And so I um, have a shout out here to Kurt who just spoke before us because we are considering a similar concept with a couple of neighboring counties. So we may be in touch for some additional information on how you made that happen. But definitely we would like to help support the um, affordable housing situation and the lack of housing situation in our local area. So here are just some additional things. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna profess to know a whole lot about construction. I'm making, my basic skills will tell you that this is a framing conversation that he's having with people, but there are a lot of cool things that go on in there. You go in there and it's a flurry of activity and everybody, a lot of hands-on, a lot of real, real getting in there and getting dirty and the students are really enjoying it and we're getting a lot of great feedback. So the second bay is dedicated to advanced manufacturing and metals fabrication. So this is our instructor, Robert Wells Clark. He used to be at the high school, but now we're happy to have him on board with us. And um, we had welding classes for quite some time, but we were seeing that the demand was increasing for welding. So we expanded that program. And instead of just doing a welding credential, we decided that if we went to advanced manufacturing and metals fabrication, that would include those welding skills. It would also include other skills that would allow our students to be and employed in multiple industries, not just specifically in a welding capacity. So the, the bays are huge. Again, if you have an opportunity, we'd love to give you a tour. But there's a lot of great space, a lot of great machinery that, again, I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't know a whole lot about the machinery. But what's great about the machinery is that a lot of it was donated. So we've got a lot of donations to help us get these programs off the ground. And then some we were purchased with some grant money. But these are the welding booths. So what I want to tell you about the welding booths is that our students built all these welding booths. There's our logo. And these are the welding booths. So the students did that. So there's a lot of hands on, not just with the sign outside, inside the welding booth. They're building their own space and they're really taking ownership about it, over it. And it really makes them excited. So in the building, there is also a smaller space and we're calling that, it's like a maker space. A maker space where we can 
invite community members to work on digital printing projects or, or all sorts of other things. We'll be having workshops and we'll be having community ed events in there where people can, can use that space. And some of it overlaps too with our programs. They might be using some of that space as part of their curriculum as well. So some of you might be familiar with our Renewable Energy Technology Program. It's a program that was ro rolled out some years ago and it was one of the first in the, in the region and it was very popular. But that program now has morphed into a, an electromechanical technology. And the reason for that is in conversation with industries, we were hearing that our students were being employed in the drone industry. They were, they were doing other things other than specific to renewable energy. So we kind of tweaked that curriculum a little bit. And just like the, the welding program being morphed, this one gives students the opportunity to be enrolled and um, employed in other areas that are similar, but not necessarily just renewable energy. So that is, again, just what we have to keep doing is keep adapting, keep keeping our pulse on what is going on and what is needed and, and feedback from employers is, is crucial to that role. These are just again the Haas trainer that's part of the Renewable Energy Electromechanical Technology Program. This is just the back of the building. So this is the final piece that I get to tell you about is the Chinook Residence Hall. So the Chinook Residence Hall, you know, we are the Chinooks, for those of you who don't know, that is our mascot. Yes, we are a fish and we are proud of it. So this, this is the building where we asked for extra money or we took some of that money that was attended for the, the skill center to build a house. And we had students living in their vans. And we had students commuting. We had a nursing student who would commute from Fossil to go to her nursing program. So we don't want students to have to be in that kind of situation, have to travel in horrible weather when, the when that time of year comes. So we have our Chinook residence hall, which is very affordable. And it's just two floors. And just to give you an idea, there's four students, or you can get an individual, four students. They have their own bathroom. They have their own kitchenette, their own living room. And then there's some common spaces. So on the first floor, there's a lounge, there's a full kitchen for students who don't want to use just the microwave and have the little fridge in their room so they can convene and get together. And then there's two RAs, two resident assistants, one on each floor in charge of you know, kind of making sure everyone's okay and safe and, and that they're somewhat behaving. I mean, these are college students after all. So this is Kim Morgan again, our, our board chair. And this is, she's kind of modeling here our student lounge so that you can see what it looks like. This is on the second floor. Again, from these windows, we have great views of the entire campus and of the gorge. This is the full kitchen that students share. And this is just, a, just an example of the room prior to, to having full furniture. And we've experienced some supply chain issues with our furniture. So we have some, some loaner furniture in there right now, but it's working and students are living there and they're able to, to go to class. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dan Spots, who, as Jessica mentioned, is our Director of Capital Projects and Community Relations. And he's going to tell you about a couple of initiatives that we are currently working on that have the potential to greatly impact our communities. So Mr. Spots, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Dr. Cronin. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. And I'm going to ask Dr. Cronin to advance slides on this one. So we've been talking about the new programs on the Dallas campus, new and existing programs on the Dallas campus. There are two other programs that we're developing. I don't have photos on the first one. That's the aviation maintenance technician training. And we hope to launch that one this coming January. That is under review by right now by the Federal Aviation Administration. So we're not really in a position to promote, to promote that program, but uh, it is something to, uh, to keep on the, uh, the radar, pardon the pun, and we'll keep you posted on that one. The other one is focused on our Hood River campus. So um, of course, agriculture affects every single corner of the Mid-Columbia region, but we do not have a, a core program on Hood River campus as we do core programs on the Dallas campus. A number of growers and others in the economic development community have come forward over the past year to encourage us to start a program that talks not only about agriculture, but also about the intersection of agriculture and technology. How do advancing technologies like robotics, remote sensing, things of that nature, affect the business of agriculture, the efficiencies of agriculture? So it's that intersection that we hope to explore with this while having a fundamental program in agricultural uh, sciences and the business of agriculture, engaging students in running a farm. So uh, Yesenia Sanchez, one of our board members is a pear grower out of Parkdale, old Parkdale Farms. And she put together these slides talking about the challenges, the near-term challenges of farming, 
rising costs, market challenges, the cost of farmland, modernizing farms and farming practices, keeping in mind that if we fail as a region to address these issues, farmland dwindles and eventually it goes away. I was having this discussion with another grower yesterday. So it's a, it's a, a really critical issue and we hope that our program, our new program, uh, that we hope to start next year, probably next fall, uh, will contribute to finding some of these answers and bring on that next generation of students, keep them engaged in farming, so important to our, to our, uh, to our economy. Next slide, please. Long-term challenges, climate change. You notice the, of course, you notice the, the glaciers receding on our mountains. Those glaciers are vital water sources for our region. So how do we respond in terms of irrigation control, uh, mitigating and minimizing water use. Uh, those are some of the technology aspects that we hope to incorporate in this program. We have labor destruction. We have global competition and resource scarcity. Again, other fundamental issues that we wish to build into the program. Next slide, please. I know we're running short here. This is the intersection that we talk about. Agriculture, education, and technology. A working title, we're calling it ATIA, Agriculture Technology Education Alliance connecting the ecosystems in a central, consistent, organized way. Again, Yesenia's slide here, and I really appreciate her for being a, a visionary and a driving force behind this. One other person I would mention, Brian Short, former uh, chair of the Port of Hood River, and uh, his vision and passion for this discussion. And one more slide, please. Finally, bringing it all together, program of study, a farmer ag tech resource. So there's an entrepreneurial aspect to this encouraging students to test out new technologies, maybe to invent new technologies. We have a small business development center to help those businesses get off the ground. That's another portion of what we're talking about. We do hope to have dedicated farmland and it would be a working commercial farm uh, to provide a, uh, an on-site on learning aspect to this and a way to test out those new technologies and maybe launch some new businesses along the way. And I think we're ready to do one other topic here. We know about the, uh, the importance and the challenge of affordable housing in our region. One other challenge that I know you're all familiar with and that's the shortage of affordable childcare. So we have uh, launched over the past six months with support from Ford Family Foundation and community partners, a feasibility study and business case to create a public childcare center. We were looking at the city of the Dalles, possibly on the Dalles campus, as we look at the economics of the study, we may be looking at a more diverse model. So looking also to uh, possibly Hood River, possibly Cascade Locks. There are a lot of questions and a lot of challenges. This is a topic, uh, again, if it were easy, somebody would have already provided this. There are economic challenges, not so much in building a facility, but in sustaining the facility over the long term. The college is not in a position to do this by itself. It's a regional issue and it's going to have to have regional solutions. So with that in mind, we are going to be convening a summit 8.30 a.m. on Wednesday, December 8th to review the study in detail. We have completed the study. Uh, Heidi McGowan East is a, a well-recognized statewide uh, expert on this topic. Um, Nancy Patton, our Director of Child Care Partners Resource and Referral has been instrumental in this and many, many others, Mid-Columbia Economic Development District, I would be remiss if I didn't know their support and participation and guidance in this feasibility analysis. So stay tuned for next steps and uh, appreciate your, uh, your attention and consideration this morning. Thank you, Dan and Dr. Cronin. Um, there's one question already. Um, have you filled all of the residents' rooms and are you able to use unfilled space to accommodate new staff members who might be looking for housing? We have not filled all the spaces yet. And uh, at this time, we have not brought people in. We've been talking to certain certain um, industries about specific, like if you have someone coming in for a week about the potential for that. And we do have a separate kind of agreement for that from the student one, so yes. We can, but not long term. So we can we can we can help out if you've got an employee coming in, part just a temporary kind of fix. But right now it's because because the dorm is not full. But once it gets full, you know the students do take priority. So we do want to help the community as much as possible. So if anyone has in that situation, they can reach out to either Dan or myself. Uh, 
Heather? I just wanted to add that um, we're really excited. To so Dr. Cronin, you talk about. Um, oh. Heather, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, that East Cascades Works, uh, the Child Care Partners, Four Rivers Early Learning Hub, and Columbia Gorge Community College also just received a grant from the Early Learning Division to explore developing a, a registered apprenticeship program that would run parallel to their early learning degree. So we're pretty excited about that possibility as well. So kind of infrastructure and workforce. Uh, Jill? Yeah, that was my question. Um, you talked about the feedback from the businesses that has helped you to create these programs and moving in. I was wondering, are you actively involving apprenticeships with the students with some of these companies under these new um, uh, areas, electromagnetic engineering? Right, like at this moment we are exploring them, but at this moment we do not have any apprenticeships. And we've been talking about starting with construction technology where they, they're working on a site, just similar to, to kind of the program that Kurt has going on, but we have no official apprenticeships right now at this moment. Is that something that you're going to be looking to create? Yes, it's something that we are. Yes. More ties with the companies. Absolutely. Area. Yes, we'd like for for that. That's a great opportunity for students to have employment upon graduation. Also, you know, if they do a good job in their apprenticeship. So certainly, that's something that we have been discussing. And we have we have advisory committees for each of these um, trades. So those advisory committees are key to letting us know what is needed locally and, and working with us to develop these, these kinds of apprenticeships or internships or whatever we decide we're calling them. Um, this is a, a question for Dan. Will that child care summit on December 8th be public and or virtual? Thank you. Thank you for asking. It will be virtual and we are sending out an invitation to multiple partners through the gorge. Anyone in this group who would like to participate in that, please email me and I'll include you. We're not opening it up and uh, noting it as a large public event. We want to have folks who uh, may among us all have uh, parts of the answer to this. It's not going to be uh, talking only about the challenge. It's going to be very much solution-based and looking at some possibilities and strategies to move forward. And to Heather's point, and Heather, thank you very much for bringing that up. A big, part, big portion of this is talking about the workforce challenge we have in ECE. The child care center, if we're able to construct it, would be a practicum site, as we have practicum sites for other uh, students uh, uh, already, for students engaged in ECE. But we need to address the, the wage scales there, the training levels, and to reduce the, uh, the turnover that we have in that workforce. There is a critical need. There are a number of slots that are open right now in the early childhood uh, workforce. So. The program that Heather mentions is going to be very, very important in helping to fill that. Any other questions for Dr. Cronin or Dan? Buck? Yeah, very good uh, presentation. I was just wondering, um, when we had a speaker earlier that was fisheries, and um, if, if the College had ever thought either doing any kind of water or any kind of uh, fishery related uh, uh, programming. Uh, kind of like in you know, a Walla Walla Community College has a uh, water that was a real um, been successful and the Umatilla tribe was uh, really influential in that. And I think there's been talk at Cryptic um, about some kind of programming like that um, just internally. Thank you. A number of years ago, we did have a conversation with fisheries biologists in our region, and that is something that we want to keep in mind. Uh, as we take on new programs, bearing in mind, we're one of the smaller community colleges in the state, so our capacity to uh, do too much at once is something we want to be careful about, but that program is very much on our minds as we conduct research and do some strategic planning, talking about workforce placement and uh, numbers would we uh, would we be able to sustain a program like that let's keep it in mind though sir any other questions well thank you again to dr cronin and dan and thank you to kurt if he is still on with us um 
I did hear Kip found his dog. So I think we're all relieved. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to take just a second to uh, thank our sponsors today. We do have um, Northwest Natural. Um, Tanya Brumley is here with us, but she also shared um, a brief video that I'm going to try to share my screen um, with you. Hopefully this works. Is this where we start talking about infrastructure and bandwidth? <laughs> Comma lack thereof. Oh, here we go. Hey. We believe carbon neutral isn't just a dream. It's a destination, one that we must reach together. And while we're focusing on the future, we're taking action today to create the energy system, our climate and children demand. In fact, we've already begun. On the coldest winter days, Northwest Natural provides 90% of the energy for our space and water heating customers, but their use accounts for just 6% of Oregon greenhouse gas emissions safely and reliably, even when the power is out. But that's only the start of the journey. Our carbon neutral vision requires many steps, and we see each one of them as an opportunity. The first is transforming the problem of waste into a powerful climate solution. Greenhouse gas emissions are generated from landfills, wastewater, food, agriculture, and forestry. We're converting this waste into carbon neutral energy called renewable natural gas which can be blended into the existing pipeline and delivered to customers. Just like wires can transport renewable energy, so can pipelines. Renewable natural gas is made using existing technologies and can work in your existing appliances. Not a far off dream. Today in North America, there are more than 300 facilities operating or under development. When the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, this carbon neutral energy provides the dependability that you've come to expect from natural gas. There is another opportunity where the existing pipeline becomes a powerful tool, renewable hydrogen. Sometimes wind, solar, or hydro can make more energy than the electric system can use or store. Thanks to new technology, we can capture this excess energy, convert it to renewable hydrogen, and the pipeline or stored for use another day. By working together with proactive energy efficiency, new technologies, and renewables in the pipeline, we can get to carbon neutral. A better Northwest, a cleaner future. Join us on the path to destination zero. Thank you to Northwest Natural and Tanya, I appreciate that. And you get bonus points if you can name where that hike was, that, that closing shot, you have to put it in the chat. <laughs> um, and also thank you to the Dallas Area Chamber of Commerce. So I'm gonna ask, uh, as one of our sponsors, ask Lisa Far Carson to introduce our next speakers. So good morning, everyone, I'm Lisa Far Carson. Our chamber has been actually serving our communities with advocacy, some business support and promotion since 1883. We're grateful to have the privilege of working with McHead and all of you for the betterment of all of our areas. So this morning, I'd like to introduce to you Dallas Freely, Regional Economist, Oregon Employment Department. Dallas Freely has been employed by the Oregon Deployment, Employment Department since December of 91. First as an employment economist in Salem, and then as a regional economist based in Hood River since 95. Scott Bailey, Regional Economist, Washington Employment Security Department. For more than 30 years, Scott Bailey has served as the Regional Economist for the Employment Security Department, Labor, Market, and Economic Analysis Branch. That is a long title there, Scott. Covering Southwest Washington. Scott and Dallas are local sources of labor market information for the region, tracking unemployment, industry trends, the occupational outlook, wages and income 
and they were key in all of the resiliency team um, issues that we dealt at the very beginning of the pandemic and gave us great information on how to do different things. So thank you very much, Scott and Dallas, in being here for the 2021 Columbia Gorge Economic Symposium. Uh, I'm not sure which one's going to go first. You guys can. Dallas is going first. Great. You should be able to share your screen. Okay. I got my mute off. Let me see if I can share my screen now. Okay. I want to share one. Oh boy. Here we go. All right. Does it look like I'm sharing my screen now? We can see the notes page. I don't know. Okay, if I'm gonna have to switch back to the other side. Unfortunately, I have uh, um, two screens. Um, so I'll go to two on that. Okay. Split screens are a great thing until you gotta do something like this. Okay, mm -hmm. are we better off this time? Great news, thank you very much. Okay, we'll start out looking where we started with respect to the uh, COVID losses in, in March and April, 2020. Oregon lost 286,000 jobs. That was a drop of 14.5%. Uh, comparatively, we look at the Great Recession. Uh, that was a loss of about 150,000 jobs over a course of uh, a couple of years. Uh, in terms of losses at the county level, uh, the the uh, greatest losses, those between uh, 15 and 26.6% were uh, in the North Coast, Hood River, uh, and Jefferson counties uh, all had the uh, largest initial loss, and that tends to reflect their large uh, leisure and hospitality uh, sectors. Uh, this is a slide that shows the initial loss in the dark blue bar and then the spring uh, loss or, or or where we, excuse me, the current loss or, or what we look like in terms of recovery. Uh, so for Sherman County, the initial loss was about 11.1% or 105 jobs. Uh, and currently Sherman is down about 35 jobs or 3.7%. Uh, Wasco County initial loss close to 12% or 1200 jobs. It's current loss and these are seasonally adjusted numbers, uh, non-farm employment, 1.8% uh, or 190 jobs. And Hood River's loss, uh, almost 24% or uh, 2,900 jobs. It's current loss, 5.5% uh, or about 670 jobs. Uh, these are uh, preliminary uh, estimates for September. Uh, and uh, I have uh, uh, final estimates for September that I'll be looking at here in a, middle, in a minute. And so the estimates uh, for the final uh, is a little bit different than, than the uh, um, preliminary, but, but not that much. Uh, so again, looking at Hood River County's current outlook, this is comparing, uh, because there's so much seasonality in Hood River, it's, it's kind of difficult to compare it to March or, or April uh, 2020. I have to compare it to uh, September 2019 to kind of incorporate the seasonality uh, and kind of get an idea of where we're at in terms of our current job loss. Um, so, and again, this is not a seasonally adjusted number. These are, these are raw. Um, so the current loss total non farm employment based on September uh, 2021 compared with September 2019, uh, 500 job loss or 4.1%. Um, there has been uh, a few industries that have added jobs, but by and large, uh, we still have losses across the board. Uh, education and health services up 60 jobs. Uh, surprisingly, accommodation, which is part of the leisure and hospitality group, uh, is up 10 jobs uh, compared to where it was in uh, 2019. Um, but leisure and hospitality uh, uh, overall still down 190 jobs and most of that lost is in food service and drinking places. So it's still about 12.5% below where it would have been um, in uh, September, 2019. Uh, here kind of graphically looking at this, uh, this shows food service and drinking places. I've got 2019. 2020, where we show the big loss, and then 2021 showing uh, where we are in terms of recovery. So a similar trend uh, 
from April forward uh, to what we saw in uh, uh, 2019, although at a much slightly lower level. Um, so somewhat of a muted uh, trend for uh, uh, 2021, but certainly a vast improvement over 2020. Uh, this is what accommodations looks like. And again, accommodations uh, is at a uh, record level in uh, 2021. So more jobs than we had in 2019. Uh, again, a record for that for that industry. Uh, I think it was poised uh, to be at this level in 2020 had there not been a setback. Um, so this really uh, perhaps isn't all that surprising. Uh, and this is arts, entertainment, and recreation, which is going to include the uh, ski resort, Mount Hood Meadows. Uh, breaking it out separately because its trend is the exact opposite of what uh, leisure, uh, other leisure and hospitality industries uh, would show. Um, so a big loss in 2020 uh, initially in March, um, but uh, uh, 2021 uh, below 2019 levels. Um, but by and large, uh, you know, doing better than um, um, food service and drinking places. Uh, Wasco County, uh, Wasco County down 360 jobs or 3.4% compared with uh, uh, September uh, 2019. Um, still doing a little bit better than Hood River County, um, but uh, and it does have some industries that have added jobs. Uh, for instance, information being one of those and Google is in uh, the information industry and it's up 140 jobs uh, over that two year period. Um, transportation, warehousing and utilities also up. Uh, but there are some job losses, retail down 70, um, leisure and hospitality uh, down 90 jobs. So still some, some uh, uh, room to make up there. And educational, excuse me, educational and health services um, is still down uh, and really hasn't added back many, many of the jobs that it lost initially in that uh, March, uh, April period. Um, and part of that could be to, due to, um, we see some losses in, uh, um, uh, nursing and residential care facilities, and then also uh, um, services to um, uh, elderly and disabled would be another area where uh, there have been some job losses. Uh, this is looking at Wasco County's leisure and hospitality industry. Um, and so we can see that uh, 2021 is an improvement over 20, uh, 2020, but definitely below, uh, considerably below uh, 2019. So we just still have some room to make up there. Uh, Sherman County, um, down 40 jobs or 4.1% compared with uh, where it was in September 2019. Um, Leisure and hospitality, uh, still down 25 jobs uh, or 20%. Uh, looking at payrolls, uh, Hood River was one of five Oregon counties that cut payrolls in 2020. Um, Hood River County's total oil industry payroll fell by 5%. 0.8 million in 2020, uh, a loss of 1%. Again, one of five counties, including Clatsop, Lincoln, Lynn, and Weather that suffered a payroll loss in 2020. Oregon's payroll actually rose by 2.4% or 2.6 billion in uh, 2020, uh, and 31 Oregon counties managed at least some payroll gro growth in 2020. But there's a reason for some of that, and that would be uh, uh, the pay pay Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which did uh, have a big impact. Um, it distributed nearly $104 million in loan assistance to eligible Hood River County businesses, total of uh, 1,307 loans, uh, with 606 loans or about 49 million forgiven, forgiven to date. Um, and to be eligible for, for forgiveness, at least 60% of the total borrowed or close to 30 million in this case had to be spent on payroll. Um, and there could be some more uh, loan forgiveness uh, coming. So there could be some impacts in 2021 in terms of uh, uh, um, PPP loans. Uh, it all depends on when the uh, loan was uh, um, made. Uh, Wasco County, on the other hand, uh, payrolls rose by 5% in 2020. Um, total all industries payroll grew by 23.5 uh, million. Um, and again, uh, Wasco ranked 11th uh, out of 36 counties uh, for its 4.8% uh, uh, payroll growth. Um, a big reason for that payroll growth, of course, is traced to one industry, uh, the expansion of Google and uh, the information industry, which added nearly $20 million. So it was up 77.4% in one year, and that is huge growth. So it basically made up the difference for uh, losses in a, in a variety of industries, although we do see some growth uh, in manufacturing and um, uh, retail trade 
and in uh, transportation, warehouse, and utilities. And in some of these industries, we see a payroll growth uh, despite job growth. That would be the case uh, with uh, retail trade. Uh, in Wasco County, uh, PPP distributed about $46 million, um, 653 loans, uh, 295 of those loans, or about $28 million forgiven to, get, to date. Um, and that would represent about $17 million uh, in payroll cost. Looking at Sherman County, uh, Sherman's total uh, all industries payroll grew by 4.1 million in 2020. Uh, that was an increase of 9.2% compared with Oregon's 2.4%. Again, 31 counties uh, in 2020 with payroll growth and Sherman ranked third out of 36. It was trailing number one Crook County, which uh, had an increase of 20.5% in its payroll and Gillum County, which had a increase of 15.4%. So in Crook County, just uh, mention, <laughs> construction payrolls were up 36 million and its information industry, which includes Apple and um, um, Facebook, uh, was up about 10 million. So a uh, good reason for uh, its, its uh, growth, again, related to uh, construction uh, and uh, um, rising payrolls in the information industry. Uh, Sherman also had some PPP loans, about 6 million. Uh, about 88 loans and 46 of those loans are about 2 million forgiven to date. So about 1.2 million uh, in uh, payrolls, what potentially was pumped into uh, Sherman County's payroll through PPP loans. Looking at uh, UI benefit payments, uh, we're still above the pre-pandemic lows uh, that we saw in early 2020. Um, September UI payments, uh, 1.5 million for the Columbia Gorge combined. Um, our uh, March 2020 baseline then uh, 0 0.7 million. So we're about double, you know, what we were before this all started. Uh, but the high month, June 2020, uh, we paid out 10.4 million in benefits in, in these three counties. And here's a look at what benefits look like at the county level. Hood River County represented 48.8% uh, or, uh, excuse me, 48.8 million or 49% uh, uh, of the uh, um, UI payments. Sherman County, 2.6 million or about 2.6%, and Wasco County, 48 million or about 48.3%. So again, uh, nearly 100 million in payroll, or excuse me, in unemployment insurance benefits paid out over uh, March 20th to September 2021. Um, the Great Resignation talking a little bit about what's going on with the labor force. So around 5.25 million uh, left the workforce during the pandemic. Uh, it seems that the, the largest uh, portion there is early retirements, uh, which uh, uh, about a little over 3 million baby boomers. Um, uh, and so for these folks, it's much harder for workers in their 50s and 60s to re-enter the workforce after, after a period of unemployment. Um, some are discouraged from looking and others uh, may have chosen to retire early uh, thanks to rising asset values such as housing and stock. Um, here's a nice little uh, graphic that the uh, um, San Fran let me see, I think it was San Diego Fed, one of the Feds put together for us. Um, and it compares uh, the baby boomer retirement trend with the uh, uh, percentage of the US population. Uh, which is retired. So the percentage of the of uh, retirees in the, in the U.S. population, the blue line, was relatively stable at around 15.5 percent until 2008, and that's the vertical dashed line you'll see there. That year marked not only the beginning of the Great Financial Crisis, but also when the oldest baby boomers, who were born in 1946, turned 62 years of age and became eligible to receive Social Security benefits. Uh, as baby boomers uh, began retiring, the percentage of retirees in, in the U.S. population grew to 18.3% in February 2020 on the eve of the COVID outbreak. Uh, the percentage then increased at a much faster rate, reaching 19.3% in August 2021. So the difference between the uh, trend and the actual retirements, 0.92%, uh, uh, that's uh, the difference between the two is what is interpreted as excess retirements. So around 3 million excess retirements um, over that period of time. Some other reasons for uh, the great resignation or the current uh, labor shortage we're, we're experiencing, uh, a record number of job openings. Um, so there's a lot of jobs to fill all at once. Uh, the economy's rapidly, rapid reopening created uh, immense difficulties uh, in matching job openings uh, with potential.
Um, ongoing fears about COVID-19 infection, still an issue. Uh, the pandemic le led many uh, workers to rethink what their priorities are. Um, and some folks uh, are holding out for a better off offer, uh, perhaps due to uh, accumulation of savings and stimulus payments, rising home values, strong investment returns, and surprisingly, because they have an, a spouse who is employed and perhaps they have to uh, um, stay home and, and uh, take care of younger children. Uh, there's an acute uh, shortage in childcare options, particularly affordable childcare. And uh, in recent months, at least in terms of our uh, estimates for employment and uh, unemployment, uh, lack of in-person school. And I'm going to turn my uh, slide control over to Scott at this point. Oh, if I can get it out of here. Stop sharing. So Dallas, I'm a little disappointed. I thought you were going to break into song with, uh, you can take this job and shove it. Um, but maybe that's not such a bad thing. I don't know. Oh, my program is not wanting to respond and let go of me here. There you um, go. Are you have control now? Because it's still saying uh -huh. I'm going to have to close the program. So I think I'm going to have to come back in. Actually, no, I think, I, think I just, uh, I think I just pumped you. You got it. Thank you. I'm going to mute myself. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I got to say, you know, I think with a lot of you, I've got this kind of love hate relationship with zoom meetings. Uh, but early this morning, when the pouring rain woke me up, I was actually kind of glad that I wasn't gonna hit the road at seven for an hour and a half of hydroplaning on the interstate to get to the Dalles. Um, okay, so here's here's the update. What's going on? Everything. It's all about COVID, right? Um, and so here's the kind of headline summary. Uh, the Columbia Gorge, in terms of job loss, was until recently doing better than the U.S. and Oregon and Washington, uh, but now is pretty closely matching Oregon. Uh, the same story for Klickitat. Uh, Skamania County, however, has continued to lag in terms of job recovery. Um, nationally, if you look, uh, most indicators are back to normal, that is pre-COVID levels. Uh, and that's a good thing, right? Well, no. Climate change kind of has to force us to rethink how we look at our economic indicators. Because gross domestic product going up, which always used to be, yay, good news, now just means we're pumping more carbon than ever into the atmosphere. And that's just not good news. That's bad news. Uh, there's, uh, and of course, uh, you've probably seen the headlines now, the big uh, global conference going on around climate change. And our kids will tell us, blah, 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 blah. Uh, don't listen to their words, look at their actions. And if their actions don't involve stopping the use of fossil fuels like uh, coal, petroleum, and natural gas, then it's all just talk. And it's getting, uh, you know, as Dan pointed out earlier, uh, this, is, this is serious stuff that we have to address. Well, we should have been addressing for decades, but we are where we are. Uh, the one national indicator that is lagging a bit is employment, and that's been pretty typical of recoveries from recessions uh, going back to the early 1990s. Um, and here's what it looked like na nationally, that really sharp drop back in April. Then over the summer, about half those jobs came back. And then there's been a slow recovery since then. And I've even, uh, numbers that were released this morning, I threw into the graph. So uh, we're just short of 3% short of where we were pre-COVID. Now this doesn't count another, um, I don't know, million and a half to 2 million jobs that we need to generate just to keep up with population growth. Um, but it's, a, it's now kind of a, a slow recovery coming back. 
Uh, if you uh, look at some of the industries, again, it's kind of the same all over. Uh, it's leisure and hospitality that uh, have been and continue to be the, the big job losers. If you compare uh, Washington, very close to the national curve, uh, Oregon doing a little bit worse, but really following the curve as well. Here's the gorge, um, which again is going to be much more sensitive uh, to swings in leisure and hospitality because that's such a large industry in, in many of our counties here. So there was a big downturn in December, January, but then it bounced back um, and was doing better until the last couple of months. Now, everything since, um, actually since March is preliminary that will be, uh, next month we'll see uh, solid data through June and then uh, estimates for July going forward. Uh, I've looked at the numbers for June for ClickTap Skamania, and they're pretty spot on to what the preliminary estimates were. Um, and there's ClickTap again, doing better than average uh, until the last couple of months. We'll see if that gets revised and Skamania doing worse. And again, it's, it's Skamania, it's all about leisure and hospitality. Uh, so if we look at the gorge by sector and look at the, uh, uh, this is for the five counties, um, the blue bars show that first two months of the steep drop and the sort of brown orange bars uh, show where we are as of September. So made up a lot of ground in leisure and hospitality, but still that's the, the big industry. Uh, we're still seeing, uh, haven't seen the recovery of jobs in particularly K-12 education and some services. And a few industries are doing better um, than they were overall, uh, like in retail trade and healthcare. Uh, and Okay, for some reason, my slide, there we go. Okay, so let's drill down to Skamania County. This looks at uh, employment in 2020. Uh, there are just over 1,900 jobs down from 2,100 in 2019. You see the big three industries there in red, manufacturing, uh, in white, the uh, accommodation and food services, and in uh, dark blue, um, local government. And especially the, well, uh, that 200 uh, job loss, most of that was in accommodations and food services. If you look at payroll, um, it's a little smaller for accommodations and food services because it's lower wage jobs there. Uh, also the wages don't include tips. Um, and uh, a, a bigger slice of the pie going to relatively higher wages in local government and manufacturing. Uh, this is, shows that same kind of job, initial job loss and um, a, a bit of the recovery going on, still a big deficit in accommodations and food services. Um, if you look at, there we go. Um, this is through the second quarter of 2021, um, fairly new data. And this shows the taxable sales and accommodations and food services. And you see there's been a good recovery, but not back where it was um, still about 20 plus percent short of where it was pre-COVID. Uh, and this looks at um, jobs by wage range comparing 2019 and 2020. So that those first set of bars look at the number of jobs adjusted for hours worked uh, that paid less than $14 an hour. And there was a big drop in that. Uh, partly that was due to the higher minimum wage in 2020, which kind of pushed jobs into the next range. But even so, if you combine those first two, you see there's the vast majority of the job loss was in lower wage jobs. And there was actually in a bit of an increase in jobs on the upper end. Uh, 
we had uh, this shows continued claims in the county, and you see the big drop off uh, early in September when the federal programs came to an end. Um, and that was uh, a bit over, um, it was uh, around 200 uh, people who were uh, county residents who were using those federal programs, the PEUC and the PUA. And here's what they did for a living uh, pre-COVID. So this breaks out the, the occupations of those claimants in that, um, that, that last week when we had the federal programs. Uh, so by that time, uh, looking at food prep um, occupations, um, earlier in the recession, the, it was the biggest occupational group in terms of claimants. Uh, but by the end, it had, uh, drop down even a little bit less than construction. And out of those 20 workers, I think uh, 11 of them were waiters and waitresses. Um, so not a whole lot of people, although I'm sure the Lodge would love to have a few of those back, back on the payrolls, um, but not a whole lot of those folks claiming um, by the end of that uh, week in September. Uh, so and those programs support uh, a lot of households in Skimania County, uh, almost $3 million a month early on in the recession, and then slowly petering out. And you'll see next month um, by October, that will be just that little blue at the bottom will be all that's left. Uh, so that's going to be an impact on households. Uh, in Skamania and really throughout the gorge. Turning on to Klickitat County, uh, the big three in Klickitat in terms of employment, agriculture, uh, ma manufacturing, uh, and government, and, and which is mostly local government. Uh, that includes two hospitals. Uh, and again, jobs were down uh, from 2019, about 400 jobs were lost, uh, just comparing the annual averages of those two years. Uh, and if you look at payroll again, that manufacturing takes up a much bigger slice um, than compared with its employment. Uh, job loss um, early on was uh, dominated by manufacturing and accommodations and food services. Um, manufacturing has not had much of a recovery while accommodations and food services has. And a number of industries uh, have actually had an increase in employment now compared to when COVID hit uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, K-12 government, uh, K-12 education, again, is another industry that's lagging in terms of employment. Uh, if you look at job loss by uh, wages, uh, again, it's, it was mostly concentrated at the lower end, although there was some job loss at the upper end as well, uh, but mostly those lower wage jobs. Uh, similarly, a big drop off in claimants in September, uh, closer to uh, 300. And these are the occupations of. Uh, those claimants in that last week where we had federal programs. Uh, so they were really split across a lot of the different occupational groups. Hey, Scott, what is in that other category? Uh, well, there's like 19 major occupational groups. These were the bigger ones. So that might include, uh, for example, education, um, it would include, so healthcare support are the more the, uh, like nursing assistants. There's another group that's healthcare professionals. That's more uh, doctors, nurses, um, and the higher skill job positions isn't included in there. Um, legal services, um, uh, like social work kind of occupations aren't in there. Um, off the top, uh, agricultural and logging occupations, things like that. Uh, 
Um, and again, big drop in benefits. It's been waning all across uh, across the summer months and will all but have disappeared starting uh, last month in October. Okay, so challenges ahead. Um, climate change, did I mention that before? Yeah, uh, public health. Uh, COVID's not over yet. Um, and I'm not gonna, you know, jinx anything by saying, oh, it looks like we're going into a new phase where it's just endemic and uh, um, who knows, this, this uh, virus has continued to surprise and perplex us. Um, but any any time we get a surge, it really impacts the economy as well as, of course, our health, our schools, and so on. Uh, labor shortage, uh, Dallas really it, uh, covered that really well, so I'm not going to talk about that. But the other issue uh, in terms of shortages is supply chain. Um, and while, while COVID is the immediate cause of supply chain issues, the underlying causes, and, and Kip talked about some of this in his presentation, but really it's, it's the, the flavor of capitalism that we've had over the last several decades. Um, it's partly policies and partly practices by corporations that have really impacted the supply chain and made it much more fragile. So there's a whole lot of industries where somewhere in the supply chain, there's one supplier for a key, um, key part. And if that supplier is taken out for some reason, or if it's in China, uh, whatever, um, it really will stop the whole thing. Uh, so we've seen that in semiconductors, for example, um, we've seen it in bicycles, um, just there's a whole range of products where there's one supplier in one part of the chain. And part of that is uh, we have not uh, enforced antitrust laws strongly at all. Again, going back to uh, mid seventies, early eighties. Um, and that's led to, uh, you know, where you had several suppliers, they've merged into one and it's just made the whole chain much more fragile. And that's what we're seeing now. Uh, and just a lot of what's happening in today's economy is um, the chickens coming home to roost. Truck drivers were having trouble getting those. We had trouble getting those before COVID hit. And the reason is it used to be a high wage job. Wages took a hit. This goes back to trucking deregulation and the schedules and working conditions of truckers got a lot worse. And so it's really hard to find truckers who last. Uh, a final challenge, racial inequities. So uh, COVID, you know, made inequities worse. Uh, so if you look at, for example, who lost their job during COVID, um, and if you look at, at where we were a year ago, uh, a year ago, the average job loss across the country was uh, just under 6%. But for um, African-American men, it was about 9%. For Latinx women, it was about 9%. For African-American women, it was almost 10%. For white men, it was uh, about a percentage point below average, so less job loss. And white women in that month, it was below average, although white women have averaged probably about a percent uh, above the average for all workers. So uh, it's been really concentrated uh, for women of color. Um, and those uh, in the latest month's data, it's not as bad, but still worse for uh, Latinx women and African-American women. Um, so we've just seen that. And as a country now, well, I, I'm just not gonna go there. Uh, we're not doing really well at uh, having any kind of a national dialogue around race, um, especially in the economy. So uh, that's, there we go. Oh yeah, the final thing, 
Uh, and again, my big worry going forward is we know there's a lot of folks who are on the verge of losing their housing through eviction uh, because they're behind in their rent. And we've had uh, um, you know, some limits on uh, evictions and where we end up with that going forward um, could be a really big challenge for our communities. Uh, and I appreciate the, the housing discussion that we uh, had earlier. Uh, it's, it's a big challenge and I'm really glad McKed has been focusing on that. Uh, so that's, uh, that's all I got. Uh, apologies, I didn't get my newsletter out last month. I'm gonna try to get one out over this weekend um, to cover the latest data and I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, both Scott and Dallas. Um, questions for our presenters? Um, there's one in the chat. I'm not sure if anybody here really knows the answer, but how soon will robotics and artificial intelligence replace CDL drivers? If that's making that career less appealing. Sorry. Uh, our experiments in uh... Have, having uh, self-directed cars has uh, not exactly been a positive one. <laughs> so um, I think the jury's still way out. And frankly, the idea of, of going out down 84 on a rainy day with uh, a robot-driven semi next to me uh, scares the heck out of me. Dallas may feel otherwise, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a note from Kim that just popped up, massive shortages of uh, bus drivers and public transit, uh, school bus drivers. Um, yeah, it's, again, I'm, I'm, I'm in Portland. Uh, it's just totally crazy situation with school bus drivers. They've had to cut a lot of routes and consolidate. Um, and it's just just getting kids to school this year. This is this is nowhere near a normal school year, um, which those of you who are parents have probably figured that out. Any questions for Dallas and Scott? Well, thank you both for the data. And like I, I posted, we will be sharing it on our website. Um, later today and so yeah we always appreciate your time and your information um so i am excited for this next portion of the agenda and thank you guys all for hanging in here with us we have um, we're down to our our final piece uh i'm going to share my screen So I, I am excited for this. This is the uh, sharing a draft of the 2022-21, or excuse me, 27 Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Um, the strategy is developed every five years as a guide to understanding the regional economy and crafting goals, strategies, and actions to create jobs, raise income levels, diversify the economy, and improve the quality of life. And we do this because the SEDS, as we, we say the acronym, provides a vehicle for individuals, organizations, local governments, education, and private business to come together and have a meaningful conversation about what capacity building efforts are needed to best serve the economic development in the region. We, the strategy was developed over seven monthly meetings with more than 100 participants throughout the series, plus additional feedback from online surveys and focus groups that were held with our Latinx and Native American communities with support from the next door. Uh, throughout this process, we explored the themes of resiliency and equitable outcomes. And participants included local and tribal governments, regional partners, ports, chambers, legislators, state and federal partners, uh, businesses and individuals. And the whole process was overseen by a steering committee made up of public and private partners representing a diversity of perspectives across the five county region. I am grateful for all of their time and energy 
and some will be joining me in this presentation in a little bit. So I am pleased to present you with a draft strategy that was developed through this long process. And the vision is for a bi-state mid-Columbia region with a resilient, thriving, sustainable rural economy that supports equitable access to diverse business opportunities that act in harmony with the area's unique qualities, values, cultural, and natural resources. At the start of the process, the group analyzed strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And just to note, different elements of a topic may appear as both a strength or a weakness, um, also on opportunities and threats. And this is a summary of those, those larger topics identified. So strengths and assets included are our scenic, natural, cultural, and recreational resources, our central location, our diverse and growing business sectors, our uh, infrastructure and our transportation modes. Um, but then some of our weaknesses also included those things, um, areas of our infrastructure and transportation that were needing improvement. Um, of course, as we've talked today, our insufficient housing stock is a, is a significant weakness. Um, the education levels and the skills of our workforce and the needs to continue to, to match that workforce with our growing industry needs. Um, and then our high poverty rate and economic disparity, as well as our, uh, our preparedness to handle natural and man-made disasters. On opportunities and threats, um, opportunities where the growth of businesses that take our agricultural products and turn them into something that brings even greater value to the region, and also that ag tech uh, sector that Dan was talking about, as well as our tourism and arts and culture, businesses, um, our natural assets and opportunity to leverage those was definitely identified. And just the, the great workforce development programs that we do have here, as well as all of the growth that we've seen in our public transportation systems. Uh, threats were, again, the having shortage impacts, um, education and workforce needs. Um, and uh, on the, the resilience, noting just extreme weather and drought conditions and how that is a threat to the region, as well as industry diversification. So uh, concerns of if, you know, making sure that we have a very diverse industry so we're not significantly impacted when one of them uh, has a, experiences a slowdown. So uh, from the vision and the SWOT analysis, the group arrived at four priority goals for broad regional expectations. Each comes with its own goal statement and supporting strategies, actions, and metrics that follow. And in no particular order, these are strong businesses, robust workforce, resilient infrastructure, and powerful regional collaboration. So I'm going to ask some of our uh, steering committee members to help with the next piece um, to talk about strong businesses. Uh, Kevin Waters, are you with us? So strong businesses, uh, the group came up with a goal statement, enhance business innovation, retention and expansion, entrepreneurship through equitable access to support services and capital, diversifying our industry mix, and enhance coordination to address barriers to growth and sustainability. And then the next slide, please. And then these action strategies that the group came up with uh, over the last several months are um, coordinating marketing efforts to increase awareness of existing business resources, including spaces, lending, technical assistance, and others, uh, develop and enhance access to business space, build and advocate for local business support network to support local businesses with accessible opportunities to develop skills and access resources, particularly around innovation, uh, attract new businesses, uh, and then increase locally available access to capital for entrepreneurs, increase the ease of navigating the financial system, and increase opportunities for businesses to explore products. Um, our next goal, Robust Workforce, I'm going to ask Austin Evans, our another steering committee member, to help. Yeah, so... Uh... To do the robust workforce, I was kind of the said steering committee, uh, one of the guys that worked on that one. And uh, it took us a little while to come to, we wordsmithed this a few times <laughs> to try to get everything in there that we wanted to get in there. But our goal statement is to cultivate a talented, multicultural workforce through diverse, 
family wage career training aligned with industry needs while providing essential infrastructure supports for workforce participation in each community. And uh, through that, we came through six strategies. Uh, the first one was to enhance tools to support our area employers. Uh, two was to enhance training opportunities to connect residents with local job opportunities. Uh, three was to provide career training and services that specifically assist bilingual and indigenous workforce needs. Uh, strategy four, as we've talked about a lot today, address childcare needs of employers and workers. Uh, the fifth one was to support strong pre-K through 12 programs throughout the region. And lastly, to improve incumbent worker skills, support retooling and upgrading skills. Uh, and Jonathan Lewis and Carrie Pippinich are gonna help with resilient infrastructure. Yes, thank you, Jessica. Um, it was a lot of fun being a part of the, the said process as my first time doing that. Um, the first time I heard about the word, heard the word infrastructure that I remember is when Al Gore and Dan Quayle were debating uh, for the 1992 presidential election. And I think the whole country kind of yawned with that word infrastructure. Uh, but we had a group of people that was pretty engaged and excited about um, talking about our area's infrastructure. And our goal statement is to ensure communities and businesses of the gorge have reliable, resilient access to infrastructure including attainable housing, high capacity broadband, sustainable sources of energy and emergency services among others to support future population demand and economic opportunities. And then I think Carrie was gonna do the next one on water, wastewater. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously water and wastewater infrastructure is really one of our most critical and basic infrastructure needs for investment in the region. Uh, the group really focused on understanding current capacity and limitations um, and needed investments in this infrastructure to support meeting our economic needs. Um, understanding that, you know, as, as we've talked about a few times today, conditions are changing, making sure we're working together to support innovative approaches to addressing water resources in particular in our region. Uh, and then looking at uh, accessing and bringing in more dollars to help address some of these large projects um, that are going to be needed to support our economy moving forward. The water pressure died on my shower this morning. So water is very, very important. Um, so the housing action strategy is the next one. Um, and this you know, has come up in, in every discussion um, throughout the gorge as a major, major issue. Uh, we want to increase awareness and understanding of housing market conditions in the gorge, um, so support some of the planning um, operations that are already going on in the various counties develop innovative strategies to support increasing attainable housing production in the gorge and enhance communication and coordination across the region to support housing development. On the broadband front, um, obviously over the last couple of years, uh, we've really uh, seen how critical this infrastructure is for our communities and our businesses. Um, and the conversation behind these four strategies here really focus on um, closing gaps in services where our communities don't have access to true broadband, as well as increasing re redundancy and resiliency of, of those connections uh, to make sure they're more reliable. Um, looking at increasing funding available as well as supporting our communities and accessing that funding to close those gaps. And then lastly, um, knowing that building the infrastructure doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get the benefits from it, ensuring that um, we're continuing to explore resources and strategies to support our communities and businesses in adopting uh, that technology and making use of it to create stronger businesses and communities. And then our energy infrastructure strategies are leveraging state requirements for the 100% renewable energy generation to support investment in our region and increase resiliency of our local energy system. And number two, to support investment that keep critical facilities and communities powered during disruptive events. Number three, to invest in energy conservation uh, both residential, commercial, and industrial to reduce cost and increase efficiency. 
and number four is to support the needs of the Native American community to connect to the Inlu sites to electricity and or support of propane for heat. So the last section here in the infrastructure piece um, is focused on transportation and a big appreciation to um, Jessica and Kate at our office for really kind of spearheading the um, Mid-Columbia Connect series focused on these and these strategies really came out of that. I'm oh, sorry, Connect Mid-Columbia, huh? it's Friday morning. <laughs> um, so the transportation strategies here focus on a couple of things, looking at coordination and planning alignment um, to support our interconnected transportation systems, um, looking at the multiple modes of transportation that help get people and goods around our region. So things like air, water, rail, um, road and bridge investments, as well as our public transit infrastructure. Um, and through, through those enhancements and investments, also continuing to think about safe, safety and capacity um, and ensuring that those options are available to, to communities across the region. Um, and then as with many of our other pieces, continuing to ensure we're thinking about resilience that helps to mitigate and adapt as we have extreme weather events and other um, disruptions in our systems uh, to support continued movement. Thank you, Kevin and Jonathan. The, trans the infrastructure one had the most pieces for sure. Um, Genevieve Scholl will, will present our, as our steering committee member for regional collaboration. Thanks, everybody. Um, the group was really focused on how we can do a better job advocating for regional legislative priorities on, in both, both states, legislatures, and at the federal level. Uh, we developed a goal statement to effectively collaborate and advocate as a bi-state region to leverage the economic assets of the Columbia River Gorge to facilitate, facilitate strong business, robust workforce, and re resilient infrastructure. Um, our four strategies uh, are really uh, focused on how we can do better working together, uh, how we can um, uh, really raise the voices of the gorge without stepping on each other's toes or getting in each other's way. Uh, so the strategy number one was to strengthen information sharing and gathering. Number two was to build on the existing collaboration of the existing collaborative groups. Strategy three was to collaborate and advocate for community projects, uh, all of those listed in the SEDS document. And strategy four, to increase capacity for our regional advocacy role. And our other uh, committee members that are here, thanks to them as well, Buck Jones, Liliana Gestovello, Hannah Browse, and Greg Davis. Um, it's, it was really a group effort. Um, so our, our next steps with the update, completing this, this strategy is, uh, from here we'll finalize the draft document and send out a notice when we have it open for public review and comment. And I'm excited that this time we'll be working with a graphic designer to, to really ensure the finished product is easy to use in both hard copy and digital format. Um, we have our, we've also started our annual process to co collect key economic development projects from our five counties to include in the document. And all of this will be presented to the McKeg board for approval in March, 2022, and then sent on to the US Economic Development Administration. So again, this was all thanks to all of the many participants that uh, came to any of the meetings or took a survey, our steering committee, the McKed board for their direction, and almost all of the McKed staff was engaged at some point in the process. Um, the next door for their outreach on the Latinx and Native American communities and sponsors of the process, the Northwest Natural and US Economic Development Administration. So with that, I will see if there's any um, quick questions um, about the strategy or the process. Okay, great. Thank you. And again, there will be uh, more information being shared 
Um, and thanks to all of you that participated. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask our, our board chair, Bob Hamlin, to, to wrap up today's event. All right, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you all for being here at the symposium. I want to also thank the presenters because I learned an awful lot from all of them, things that I had not thought about before. And I think judging from the comments in the sidebar chat, that a lot of you also learned a lot. So thank you to them for sharing their thoughts. Um, also, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Dallas Area Chamber of Commerce, Northwest, Northwest Natural, and the US Economic Development Administration. Um, this has been an interesting period of time in our economic history here in the Gorge. And I think that uh, we recognize that by working together, both in the private and the public sector, sector we're uh, going to be able to get through some of the hard times and get to the other side. So I think that's an important uh, idea to keep in mind. And as the final reminders before we part, I would like to uh, mention that we will be posting the presentation, presentations from today on the MCAD website. Uh, we will also be sending out a post-event survey so that you can give us feedback so we can improve the symposium as we make this an annual event. And we will hope you will join us in November 2022. And thank you to everyone for all that you do for the Gorge. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. And uh, check out the chat. Emily Reed shared about an event that they have going on, as well as the Gorge Pass. So thank you so much. Have a great day. And uh, we'll get these materials posted. Thank you.